Well, good morning, everybody. Let's um, take our Bibles, if we will, to Jeremiah chapter 3, as we get started. Jeremiah chapter 3. We're going to start at verse 6. Jeremiah chapter 3. Look at a few things this morning. Hopefully it'll all make good sense. <clears throat> it makes good sense if we know how to listen to it. It's all the word of God. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 3 starting at verse um, 6. It says, The Lord said also unto me in the days of Josiah king, Hast thou seen that which backsliding Israel hath done? She has gone up upon every high mountain and under every green tree. There and there hath played the harlot. I was thinking about a lot of our churches and denominational people today. You know, they're not going out just a little bit and a little bit off beat. They're going way off beat. They're going everywhere, dragging in garbage from out of the world and trying to incorporate it into the church and call it worship of a true and living God. You can't drag sin in and condone it and call it godly no matter how you label it let's look at verse 7 and i said after she had done all these things turn thou unto me but she returned not and her treacherous sister judah saw it what i was thinking about is if as we're acting and if we're doing things if we're not we're being an example to someone okay as a person as a church we're being an example to others and if we're doing the wrong thing and accepting the wrong things, condoning it, allowing it within our walls, we're teaching it. And I saw when for all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a bill of divorcement, yet her treacherous sister Judah feared not, but went and played the harlot also. And what he's talking about is Israel had gone so far out until he allowed them to be taken into captivity. And once they were taken into captivity, Judah saw it, but then went along following doing the same thing anyway. And it's, you know, if you see the punishment of other people for what they've done, why do people keep chasing after it? I was thinking about all of the, I guess, popular people, for lack of a nice way of putting it, the ones who have millions of fans, yet they wind up killing themselves with drugs or whatever because they have something missing in their lives. They burn out. They burn down. And people are still chasing, wanting to find what they thought they had. There's nothing there if God isn't there. Look at verse 9. And it came to pass through the likeness of her whoredom that she defiled the land and committed adultery with the stones and with the stocks. Now, through the likeness. Now, that's the casualness. And you look at the casualness to which people are approaching sin in this country and in churches these days. It's real casual. It doesn't matter. They're not worried about it. They don't acknowledge it as sin. They don't try to root it out from amongst them. They don't try to preach the truth. They're so afraid that they might offend someone by telling them that they're a hell-deserving sinner. <gasps> Yeah, well, I am too. A hell-deserving sinner only saved by grace. I'm not perfect in this flesh. I'll do things to break your heart. I'll hurt your feelings. I, you know, there's there's all sorts of things that ain't right with me and won't be right until I'm with the Father in heaven. And yet for all her treacherous sister Judah hath not turned unto me with her whole heart, but faintly, saith the Lord. Now look at that. After Judah saw what happened to Israel, they didn't turn to God but with, with, with faintly or fakely or with um, pretense, they pretended to turn around. I was thinking about how our country was at nine, after 9-11. The churches was full of folks seeking God. But you know what I'm thinking? Maybe the reason that they didn't stick, many of them, was because how many are pretending to be godly? How many are pretending to teach God's word and they're just scratching itching ears and they're telling you, I'm okay, you're okay. Would you drop a little dollar in the pot before you leave and we'll be better? Are they preaching the truth of God's word? Are they preaching that we have to turn to God and we have to acknowledge what we've done is not right sometimes? Let's look on and he, 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 he explains it very clearly. 
And the Lord said unto me, The backsliding Israel has, Israel has justified herself more than the treacherous Judah. So the one that gotten so bad that he punished, they repented more than the one that he had been letting slide. The one that he made an example for ignored the example. The one that he made an example of was beginning to get it. And I wonder sometimes, do we get ourselves in a spot where God makes an example of us because we didn't follow the examples he set before us? He didn't. We didn't take the teaching that he gave us. Verse 12 says, Go and proclaim these words toward the north and say, Return, thou backsliding Israel, saith the Lord. He's always telling us return where he is. He's telling us return. And I will not cause my anger to fall upon you, for I am merciful. Look at that. We turn. He's merciful, saith the Lord, and I will not keep anger forever. Remember, we serve a merciful God. Look at verse 13 of what I was talking about a second ago. Only acknowledge thine iniquity. Acknowledge it. Don't try to cover it up and lie about it. Don't say, oh, well, it's okay. God don't mind anymore. Well, yes, he does. If we're sinning, he minds. And you're thinking about David, how he was a murderer, an adulterer, kind of in the worst fashion, but he acknowledged it. He didn't try keep trying to cover it up and hide and go, I did no wrong because I'm the king or I'm me or whatever. He acknowledged it. Yes, Lord, I'm, I did it. I shouldn't have did it. He didn't say, I'm the king so I can do what I want to do, like Saul did, and he had his king, the kingdom snatched from him. He would never acknowledge any of his iniquity. That's the difference. Acknowledge that we are hell deserving sinners. Let's look at verse 13. Only acknowledge thine iniquity and thou that thou hast transgressed against the Lord thy God and hast scattered thy ways to the strangers under the, every green tree. And ye have not obeyed my voice, saith the Lord. Acknowledge that we haven't obeyed him like we're supposed to, that we've done the wrong things. But look at this. Turn, O backsliding Israel, saith the Lord, for I am married unto you, and I will take you one of a city and two of a family and will bring you to Zion. But look at this. This is the beautiful part. And I will give you pastors or shepherds according to mine heart, God's heart, which shall feed you and with knowledge and understanding. So to be fed with true knowledge and understanding, we have to acknowledge our iniquity. We have to acknowledge that we're not who we are as a nation, as a church. And God will supply us pastors if we understand that we don't understand what we could. And we're seeking him and turning to him and acknowledging our own iniquities. He'll supply what I've talked about before and I've preached about what I call enabling grace. Every time God gives us that light, if we'll take that light and we'll use it to try to grow in him and try to learn more of him, he'll provide more and more about himself and he will fill us with himself so that we can live that abundant life. It's not a book about positive thinking that's going to get you there. It's acknowledging who we are and who he is. And then we can have that life. Let's look at Matthew chapter 7, starting at uh, verse 1. Matthew chapter 7, as Jesus is speaking here. <clears throat> this is one of the ones that, one of my pet peeves of way I've seen people preaching on this, and I'm, you know, I think it's part of what people not acknowledging their own and not acknowledging sin within the church. Starts off, judge not that ye be not judged. A lot of people want to stop right there. Don't you judge me. Only God can judge me. <laughs> well, you better judge yourself. For with the, what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured unto you again. Uh, you know what that's really saying? Don't try expect people to be better than you. Don't try to put more on them. Like when you're raising kids, I expect you to be better than me. You learn from my mistakes. Oh, really? Well, didn't we see that Judah wasn't learning from Israel's mistakes? It's hard to learn from each other's mistakes. We should, but we won't acknowledge it. It won't happen to me because I'm a little smarter than that. I can get by with it a little better. <laughs> Isn't that the famous last words? 
But just know that what, however we're judging, we need to be judging ourselves as harshly or more harshly than we do others. Okay? That's what it's about. Judge yourself. It, it even clears it up in here. And why bo beholdest thou the mote in thy brother's eye, but considers not the beam that is in thy own eye? Look at herself. See what's the matter with us first. Maybe we can correct, help somebody correct them. Maybe we can come alongside of them, especially if we've been there and be like, you know, I struggled with the same thing I see you struggling with. Can I pray for you? Not get in their face and pick a fight for Jesus, but can I pray for you? Is there anything I can do to help you? Oh, how wilt thou say to thy brother, let me pull out the moat out of thine eye and behold a beam in thine own eye? Thou hypocrite, first cast the beam out of thine own eye, then thou shalt see clearly to cast a moat out of the brother's eye. Acknowledge. Acknowledge that we have a problem sometimes. Give not that which is holy unto dogs, neither cast ye pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend thee. Now what is that about? How did that fit in there? I'm glad you asked. Because I struggled with that and thought about it for a while and prayed over it. And over the years, here's what I've come up with. There's a time, I mean, you've seen people go out street preaching, okay? Well, there's a time to do that probably, and there's a time to go out. But what he's talking about is don't go get in somebody's face that isn't ready to seek God, that isn't acknowledging God, that the Holy Spirit hasn't prepared their heart because you're going to jump in there and you're going to get stomped or you're going to get your feelings hurt because you went on your own. You didn't carry God with you. You went going to do something for God, and then you get a beat down. Well, why is that? Was God in it? No, he wasn't. Because I decided I was going and I was going to do something. And I didn't went under my own strength, carrying God's word, which is very powerful. But God's word, if I'm throwing it in the face of somebody who is not ready, not going to help. It is a waste of my breath. It is a waste of time. And it is hurting more than it's helping. Because people are sitting on the sidelines or seeing the fight and seeing the argument that you picked. And you're out there arguing with somebody who has no knowledge and no desire for God. And you're just wasting it. Live your life in such a way to where they will ask you or preach it in such a way that they'll want to know. And they'll come with their cup to be filled with Jesus and don't, don't come along throwing it on them. Because you're wasting it. Ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. So we're seeking his will in our lives. And we're seeking to spread his word. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. God's there for us. As long as we're acknowledging who we are and who he is. And we're Seeking his will. Oh, what man is there? Look at this. We're talking about God giving back. Oh, what man is there from whom if his son asked bread will give him a stone? Is there any? Or if he asked a fish will give him a serpent or a snake? If then, being evil. See, Jesus is saying being evil. We're evil whether we acknowledge it or not. We need to acknowledge it that we are know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask him? If we're asking him to give good things, if we're asking him to teach us about himself, to uplift us, to feed us his truth, to be who he wants us to be so we can live joyous and complete lives. He'll fill us. Let's look at uh, Romans chapter 8, starting at verse 31. Romans 8 at 31 says, What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? And how do we have God for us? Acknowledge him. Acknowledge who we are. Acknowledge that we are sinners. And that knowledge that he is merciful. Know who he is. Seek him in his truth. And not try to hide who we are. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us. All... How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Think about what he's done for us. 
He emptied himself of all his glory and came down and lived in this so that he could redeem us to himself to make our relationship right again with him. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. So whenever folks come bringing up garbage from the past or that you've done, acknowledge, I'm not perfect, nor was I perfect. God is, and he's got me in his hand because I'm his. I put my faith, trust, and hope in him. I believed on him, and I called on him to save me. So you're irrelevant in your opinion, religious person. It is about how God, how I see God, how he sees me. It is my personal relationship that saved me, not your opinion. See some preachers turn into the book of opinions all along. Verse 34 says, Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who maketh intercession for us. He's there making intercession for us. If we've, put our, if we've called on him for salvation, though we're not perfect. We're not living perfect. We need to strive and acknowledge. Acknowledge every time to ourselves. We don't necessarily have to tell everybody, oh, hey, everybody, guess what I've done? Guess what I thought? No, we acknowledge it to God. We tell him, God, I, I know that's not supposed to be in there. Help me. Help me get past it. Cleanse me. Help me do better tomorrow. Look at James chapter 1, starting at verse 16. James chapter 1, starting at 16. Do not err, my beloved brethren. <clears throat> every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variables, neither shadow of turning. Now look at that. You take that and put it together. No variables, neither no shadow of turning in our Heavenly Father, which means if it was a sin 500 years ago, it's a sin today. If it was a truth then, it's a truth now. You have to take the scripture and apply it where it's applied. It's kind of like uh, that old black draw quick sale. It's really good stuff if you put it on the right thing. But if you stick it in your eye, it's going to be a problem. And that's the way it is with God's word. A lot of people take some of it where it's supposed to be applied to a sore and they'll stick it in your eye. That ain't where it belongs. That's not how it works. You have to apply it correctly. Of his own will beget he us with the word of truth. The word of truth is Jesus Christ. Salvation. That we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear. Now this, this verse beats me up. Be swift to hear. You got to listen. Slow to speak. Oh, I've got a quick answer. That's not me. Slow to wrath. But I get angry really quickly. God said, stop it. I have a temper like a snake. God says, stop it. Acknowledge it. Look at it. Give it to him. I had a lot of trouble with that. Slow to speak. I got an answer. You may not want to hear it. Stop it. Acknowledge it. Give it to him. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness. Oh, I want to hang on to my parts of it. All superfluidity. Oh, that's abundance of naughtiness or of wickedness. The abundance of wickedness we're supposed to get rid of and receive meekness. Now, what's meekness? That's the opposite of some of the rest of that. It's not weakness. It's slow to anger. Slow down our anger. When someone comes at us with something, be slow to anger. Try to figure out why are they trying to get you to rage with them. If you rage with them, you're as big an idiot as they are. Okay? And you're not winning any argument by being the loudest, even though that's the way things are seem to be done these days. With all meekness, the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. What's going to save our souls? Meekness or the engrafted word? What's the engrafted word? That's Jesus Christ. That's where we find it in Romans where it says, believe in your heart and call on him. 
to save you. Be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. You ever seen anybody that lied to themselves? Seen some that say, told me they were a great artiste and I seen some of the drawing and I'm like, woo, your mama loves you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. Or a great cook and they come up with this cuisine and you look at it or you smell it and like, woo, I'm sure, I'm sure somebody likes that. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass, looking at a reflection. For he beholdeth himself and goeth away and straightway forgiveth what manner of man he was. You ever seen some of these, uh, I call them CEOs, Christmas and Easter only, the kind of Christians, you know? They're very religious two times a year, maybe three. And they get all gathered up and they go in and they're super religious, but then they forget as soon as they get back out there because if, you, if, you, if you're around and they don't, they don't see you and you hear them talking to others, they don't sound nothing like any Christian you ever heard of before. Their mouth is bad or worse than anybody else's. Forget what manner of man he was. So that, does that mean that he was really a changed person or did he change his habits for a little while? and faked that he was saved amongst the saved people. So he wouldn't really ever get it. He was a fake. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continues therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. So what's that? That's whenever you know you've got your full salvation because you can't be still and you can't shut up about it. You can't go back into all of the garbage without acknowledging, at least between you and God, that you've done wrong. You haven't got to spread it amongst everybody and let everybody know every evil thought that you ever had, but you have to acknowledge it. You have to work towards getting rid of it. If any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is in vain. Pure religion and undefiled before God, the Father, is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and keep himself unspotted from the world. Now how do you keep yourself unspotted from the world? By acknowledging it and giving it to him every time. You're not going to be perfect. You're going to have problems. But we have to acknowledge our sin to him. As it said in the other verses, we have to actually care about people. Actually show God's love. Let him live in us and not do it all ourselves or try to be it all ourselves or try to cover it up and hide it as if we're perfect because we're none perfect except in Christ. We can do all things through Christ which strengthens us. And what does it say? Um, Jesus Christ the same today, yesterday, and forever. And you see back here where it said, no shadow of turning. It's the same God forever. He hasn't changed with a new, for the new times in the new world. Sin is still sin. The difference is we've got all these religious people trying not to acknowledge it and telling you not to acknowledge it. So you're like the man that looked in the mirror. You saw something and they said, don't look at that. We need to look in the mirror every now and then and see what's in there because it may be something we want to change. And if we're not looking at it and looking at it in a godly way and comparing it to the truths of God's word. We may be religious, but we're not going to be saved. We may be a child, but we're not a child of God. We need to put our faith, trust, and hope in Him and acknowledge His truths and not try to interpret it. We need to take and apply God's Word where it goes. It's like I said with the quick draw salve or the black draw salve. Put it on the sore. Don't stick it in your eye and expect it to have the same result. You've got to have, you've got to apply it correctly. 